Hello, everyone. This is Nairi from Low Carbon Fasting. Well, this episode is part of the series on my channel called Type 1 Diabetics Talk, where host and guests or guests are type 1 diabetics. And you guessed it, we discuss type 1 diabetes management. Well, today's topic is looping with, um, with an insulin pump and a continuous glucose monitor. I have returning guests, Alison Hershady and Michael Fitzpatrick. Welcome mm -hmm. to Low Carbon Fasting. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Well, it's good to have you back. Uh, and um, Alison, I'll put your video in the bottom or I'll put our previous video in the bottom as well in the description, um, Michael. Mm -hmm. But what we discussed prior to this episode had nothing to do with uh, with looping. So I'm really excited to find out. I'll start off, uh, Alison. My daughter was asking me earlier on and she said, so what's, what's today's interview about? And I said, okay, we're discussing looping. Uh, and she went, what's that? And I said, well, it's when... <laughs> I have to keep it simple. So I said, well, it's when the CGM and the insulin pump talk to each other. <laughs> How far off was I? Very, that's exactly what I say. <laughs> is that what it is? Okay, so what, do, what does a type 1 diabetic need other than those two devices to be able to set up looping? And what exactly is it? Well, there's a few different definitions. It, it all is under the umbrella of automated insulin delivery based on hybrid closed loop system. We have a few commercially available ones. Currently, we have the Medtronic, the newest version is the 780G. We have the Omnipod 5, and then we have the Tandem X2 with Control IQ. All of these systems tend to have higher targets than most of us in the Bernstein community are targeting. Yes. So we are relying more on the open source closed loop systems which are Android APS or AAPS, the loop system, and IAPS. And these systems are mainly using the Omnipod Dash, though you can use some other pumps such as the Omnipod Eros or an older Medtronic pump with a device called a Riley Link that allows the two to talk to each other. So the so So you need an Omnipod and a Dexcom and either an Android phone for AAPS or an iPhone for loop. So do you know if any of the Freestyle Libre devices are compatible? I'm honestly not sure about that. We'll find out. So if yes, anyone is looking and they're using a Freestyle Libre system, which is actually more available or more readily available in Europe, and I know it is more readily and much, much more affordable um, oh, absolutely. UK as well. So it'd be interesting to find out if Libre is also suitable for looping. Uh, Michael, which uh, so what which devices are you using? So I use the Tandem uh, Control IQ, um, and interestingly, um, I also do um, uh, MDI multiple daily injections for my bolus. So I eat a very high protein, low carb meal, but I take our insulin separately. So I try to just let my pump uh, manage my basal rates, and I use my pump to do any kind of um, hyperglycemia corrections. Uh, and what I love about the pump is that uh, I can do fractions of a unit uh, for corrections. So I can take, I can keep very tight control. And for the past um, year and a half or so, since I've been using this pump, I've been able to keep an, an A1C of 5% uh, or under, so. Wonderful. That's brilliant. So which uh, CGM are you using? Uh, right now, I'm using the G6. Uh, I did try the G7 for a bit, but it really, um, I had some trouble with it. I hear they are updating um, some of the Bluetooth. I had a lot of problems with the connection, the um, Bluetooth connectability, um, and some accuracy. So I opted to go back to the G6. So I have a, a supply of the G6. And then when that runs out, I'm going to try to get G6 extended. But um, after that, I'm going to have to be lumped in with the G7. I did hear that... Um, Libre has the 2 Plus, I think it's called, mm -hmm. which is now uh, compatible with tandem uh, control IQ pumps. So if the whole Dexcom thing doesn't work out for me, I'm definitely going to try out uh, the Libre system. So I did hear that 
it was going to be, I think Omnipod is also supposed to be linking up a Blu-ray. But yeah. I've, I'm encountering the same thing. I My insurance <clears throat> kind of forced me to the G7 and I found it to be noisy and it's affecting loop because it's just so jumpy. It'll be 87 and then it's 128 and it's just back yeah. and forth and back and forth and it's adjusting my insulin based on that. Yes. So I just went back to the G6 and I'm going to keep them as until I'm out of G6s and then I'm going to go into be forced to G7. Yeah, it's it's a huge problem if you are dependent on an accurate and stable CGM system um, to give you insulin. Um, if it's not accurate, it's a very scary thing. I actually had some very serious lows uh, thanks to the G7 inaccuracies and Bluetooth disconnections, um, which um, I really don't have with the G6. So I, I heard that uh, the G6 was is a little bit bigger than the G7, so they may have taken out some of the antenna or something like that. But um, it's definitely a problem that I've noticed. Um, and if you are interested in looping, um, it's something to consider before you you start. So. Right. So, um, so what? So what third device are you both using? Third, third not device, but software. Third party so software. I am using loop. Set your targets how you want. I'm using the loop system. Right. So, what does some someone need to do to be able to download that and set it up? Because I'm very much interested, but I have no idea how to go about it. So I know, of course, for my viewers, I will put Allison's details below and you're welcome to contact Allison. Allison is a uh, um, certified diabetes educator as well. So uh, I'll put your details below, Allison. But Mike and lots of other loopers are actually available, always available to give advice online as well. Find low carbohydrate or Bernstein, uh, pro Bernstein. Uh, groups on Facebook, uh, probably elsewhere as well. But, you know, the, I think most of the activity um, in our community happens on Facebook. So find them on Facebook and contact them. They're all happy to share their experiences. But Alison obviously can give you advice as well. So Alison, how does someone need to set it up? Do they need professional help? I know I do, but not everyone is... Uh, you it know, depends on the individual. I take ignorance, I, right? <laughs> I started with AAPS and I was able to build the app myself. It was a bit daunting. It, it is overwhelming when you look at the instructions. You think I can't do this. I'm, I'm not a programmer. I'm not a coder. I have no idea what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I was able to do it simply by following instructions. But at one point I said, if you can follow a recipe, you can build the app. But then someone else pointed out, well, there's a difference between, you know, making microwave popcorn, making a souffle. Um, so it could be difficult. It could be out of reach for some. With uh, up to recently, Loop was only available if you built the app yourself because it is an open source closed loop. It's not FDA approved. Mm. So it's still considered experimental at your own risk. But there is now a company that I am working with called T1Pal who builds, supports, hosts Loop for you. So you uh, would get with the with their company. Um, they build your Night Scout for you. They build your loop for you. And you pay something like $50 a month. And they can post it and support it for you. So all you basically have to do is download it. That's good to know. Uh, yeah. well, maybe we can put their details yeah, um, absolutely. in the description as well. Michael, how did you go about it? With uh, so I use the, uh, the setting it up. So it um, it keeps a artificially high, at least to me, target range. Um, I keep my pump in sleep mode twenty four seven. A lot of people don't know about that, but um, it's got two modes. It's got exercise mode and sleep mode. And sleep mode kind of keeps it down a little bit more. But um, at the same time, I try to target uh, in the eighties uh, and maybe nineties as much as possible. So I find myself having to take micro bolus corrections uh, throughout the day, which isn't too much of a, a pain in the neck, uh, but it's it's a way that I've found to uh, make the software work. 
Um, it's also great because I do a lot of uh, exercise. I do a lot of weightlifting and endurance running. Um, so using my pump, I can put it in exercise mode, which decreases the basal. Um, and it will automatically shut off if it detects that I'm going to get hypoglycemic, uh, which is a, a really good tool to use and something that I really appreciate about um, being off the long-term basal shots like um, Basaglar, Lantus, and Levomir and that sort of thing. So that's one big pro I, I find with the pump. I was quite impressed with your results, Mike. Oh, because thank you. most most people run high and they're so frustrated with the system that you're just working ninja level magic. Yeah, I I'm I'm on top of uh, my sugars. I'm, I uh, constantly test throughout the day. Um, I can tell uh, in my body because I'm running normal sugars all the time. If I'm running like if, if I'm at like 120 uh, milligrams per deciliter. Like I can tell that I'm a little bit high and that I need like yeah. a, a little bit of insulin just to bring me back down. Um, so that's really kind of the game that I'm playing uh, day after day and it's gotten me really good results, so. I'm exactly the same way. I start feeling off, like, you don't feel right at 120. And at one point I didn't feel good unless I was 200. So it's, it's a whole yeah. different way. Yep, so it, it, it can be done uh, with the tandem system. I know a lot of people uh, don't have the, the sub 5% uh, with tandem control IQ, but it definitely can be done. Well, my Dexcom and Omnipod um, also have, they also talk to each other to put it simply, and it has that automated version where it takes control of, you know, of your highs and lows. All you have to do is obviously input your carbs. It asks for carbs. Um, yeah. But I got frustrated with it because it was keeping me too high. I gave it two weeks and I thought, no, my health is suffering. I mean, even two days running high is like, you know, we feel awful, right? And I gave it two weeks and then I went back to it and I thought, I'll give you another chance. And now I've given up on it. So it has two modes, not sleep mode, but mine has um, manual and automated. So I switched to manual mode and um just manually managing with micro doses, as you said, of insulin, um, much better than it was doing on the automated way. You were never going to win because the algorithm does not work for us. The algorithm is set up to where it's learning, they say learning, mm -hmm. learning your total daily dose. And then it's attempting to put you at 50% basal and 50% bolus. And any of us who follow Dr. Bernstein or eat low carb, we know we are not 50 50. At least the vast majority of us are not. I'm maybe 80, 85, mm -hmm. 20, 15. Um, much more basal than bolus because I'm not eating many carbs. So when that system is seeing you're not bolusing, it's pulling back on your basal. Yeah. Right. So that's what it's doing. This is what it's Trying doing. Trying to make you 50 50. I hadn't, <laughs> wow. I hadn't figured it out. I don't figure it out. Um, okay, so what, um, oh, I'm only using my pump, Michael, um, but you are using our insulin, which I think would be the better, I mean, it probably is the better strategy, um, except that I can't talk from experience, but you are using our insulin for your meals and the pump is giving you your basal. So the insulin in the pump, I presume, is rapid acting, right? No, no, no. I need no block, yes. No. So, so the, yeah, so the, uh, the R insulin, so when I first started using my pump, I did not use R insulin. Um, so to cover my high protein meals, I'd have to do a couple um, square wave boluses where you do an extended bolus over two hours, then that would end and I'd have to do another bolus just because the, the protein takes that much time for, uh, to metabolize. Um, but I found with, with taking the R insulin, um, it really matches the protein rise uh, extremely well. Uh, and if I miscalculate um, just a little bit, then the pumpkin, the basil from the pump kind of takes over. I can do the micro corrections with the pump. Um, and if I have uh, like a little bit more carb in a meal than um, normal, like I might have like some, some greens or some salsa or something with my chicken, I'll just give like, a, like half a unit of Novolog uh, bolus, and then I'll take like a, a regular bolus of R insulin to cover that. And that usually covers my meals pretty well. 
I think you kind of alluded to it, but you know, my next question is, so your pump doesn't know that you have our insulin on board. Right. So is that ever a problem? I, um, I don't think so. Uh, yeah. if, because I'm very cautious with the amount of insulin that I'm taking. So, uh, and the pump is very aggressive when it comes to shutting off any basal that comes in, if it thinks that I'm going to get low. Um, so I, I would say that it's actually working pretty well. There's, there's a handful of us that use the pump and are at the same time. Um, and right now I think it's, it's pretty optimal. So I would say if you have your R doses dialed in, yeah. the loop can just assume you're fasting. Right. Now, if they're not dialed in, that, that could be problematic. Yes. Oh, listen, what insulins are you using? You're using R and Novo Novolog. I'm using Lumjev, the ultra rapid version of Humalog. Right. And I use R only for very high protein meals, like a steak or uh -huh. a pizza bowl, or we have a Mexican restaurant that has a meal called a fiesta platter. And I do chicken and beef and shrimp with a cheese sauce on top of broccoli. And it's a ton of protein. I use R insulin for that. Right. But for most of my meals, I'm just using one. So, so how do you input your meals? How do you work out your bolus? Well, I bolus up front for my carbohydrate, for my, for my vegetables. Mm -hmm. There's a couple options that you can use in Luke. A lot of my uh, clients are doing what we call future carbs. We are inputting, we are announcing carbohydrates in the future. And then we're putting it over a certain absorption period, such as four hours, five hours, six hours, and letting loop know that these carbohydrate equivalents are going to be here at this point in the future, an hour and a half, two hours, whenever we tend to see that protein rise. So you don't have to think about it an hour and a half from now. For me, I don't use that so often. I'm more using what we call overrides or presets, where if I see I'm starting to rise, I'm going to tell Luke, give me 150% for an hour. So I'm just kind of playing with the system to manipulate it to catch the protein rise. So with the system, Alison, what what what's what target can you set it at? The lowest target is 87. Lowest is 87. So what do minus you set it, minus set at 87. Yeah. Right. I so usually advise people to start a little bit higher just until we know their settings are dialed in for safety. So maybe 100 to 110 and then we'll dial it back down. Mm-hmm. But I think that's pretty darn close. I think that's probably as good as we're going to get in the U.S. anytime soon. Oh, oh that's, that's, I mean, I would love that. I absolutely yeah. would love that because my, my system, the lowest I could set it was uh, 120, I think. 120. Lowest 120. I mean, if I'm 120, oh. I actually take, like Mike was saying, I take a micro, micro, <laughs> micro dose of, uh, of novel, novel. Right. Is Novolog, same thing. Mine is Nova Rapid, and to correct it, yeah, <laughs> I don't want that to be my lowest, so uh, my target. And I haven't found, I didn't find a way to sort of override that. So, um, even in manual mode, the lowest target in Omnipod 5 is 110. Yeah, agree, agree. It's crazy, it's crazy. I just have a question to go back for these artificially high targets. Who who is setting those targets? Is that the FDA or is that the individual companies themselves that are doing that? My guess is the individual companies, and then they're being regulated by the FDA. But the problem comes in is safety, because right. for the vast majority of people using insulin, they're eating a standard diet. They're, they're eating down, large right? amounts of carbohydrate, which are unpredictable, and mixing that with rapid-acting insulin, which is unpredictable. So if we test set a target of 87, for someone eating 300 grams of carbs a day, that's going to be dramatically, yeah. I mean, that could be very dangerous. Yeah. So, so like a, a 70 standard deviation, a target of yeah. 87, they're going to be in the 30s all the time. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and they would actually at 87, that person, a high carb eater. I've been there. I know it. I know it. You've been there too, Alison, right? Yeah. So 87. Yes. I would have felt hypoglycemic at 87. Yeah. And I, I did. Was taking a time at 87. <laughs> and that's not even technically a hypoglycemic episode, but I would have been shaking and 
Um, yeah. Um, I, I have I a memory of being in the doctor's office shaking and they tested my sugar and it was 80 and they're like, you're fine. You're normal. And I'm like, no, I have to have something now. And they wouldn't give it to me. And I was panicking. Mm -hmm. So I clearly remember that. So it is safety, as you said, and I think they're also following the um, target range set by the American Diab Diabetic Association. They don't want to, you know, do anything different, yeah. right? It's for safety. Yeah, I just think it would be great if we could set our own targets, but that's just me. Let me sign a waiver, you know. <laughs> I'll sign a waiver. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yes, I, I think that, that actually that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. If we could sign a waiver and then they would allow us maybe um, to personalize, to customize the device. I mean, at the end of the day, these devices cost a lot of money. And for a while, actually, I paid out of pocket. I paid cash for my um, pod, Omnipod, and for my CGMs. Um, cause I do a lot of traveling and there is a certain number of days if you're away from, you know, your home country, well, in my case, it's UK, right. Then I have to self-fund stuff. So I bought nine months worth of, um, CGMs and pods out of pocket. These are expensive. So if your insurance isn't paying for it, your healthcare isn't paying for it, then you, the least you can expect it to do is to actually allow you to set your own target on it. I got so frustrated, particularly when I was paying out of pocket, because then it really hits me. I'm paying all this money and it's not really serving me well. Oh, how frustrating. Can people contact you via Diverge for help to set up their loop, uh, looping system? Yes. We're now offering Loop Copilot services. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, I think the price is going to go up at some point, but currently it's two seventy nine for five calls. I will meet with you initially to determine your settings. You'll have your calls with T One Pal. I will be present for those calls, then I will follow up twenty four to seventy two hours later, as needed. We could do twenty four and then do seventy two if necessary. A week, two weeks, and then we'll do a final call, and then we have chat support in between those calls. So typically within a month, you're pretty dialed in. Michael, uh, how can people find you online? <laughs> so I'm on um, Facebook, all the low carb groups, also on Twitter, it is Mike Fitz. Um, and also just to go back, Diverge is a fantastic company. I can't recommend them enough. I was um, a client of theirs not too long ago um, and they, if you are really interested in normalizing your blood sugars and need help, um, I can't recommend them strongly enough. So um, give Allison a call, shoot them an email. Um, I'm not just saying that because um, here I'm saying that as a type one diabetic, like if I was newly diagnosed, they would be the first people that I would call right away just after I ordered Dr. Bernstein's book, which is a little thick, but they can help you get through everything. So, um, so yeah. Thank you. Well, I think Lisa, uh, Lisa, uh, Lisa Lanasa, Lanasa, the director of Diverge, will be very proud that we gave her a mention. And of course, I have to reiterate what you two said. I haven't used Diverge's services, but I know exactly what goes on um, at a managerial level because I sit on the advisory um, board for Diverge. So that's um, and I'm not just saying it because I'm biased. I'm on the advisory board, which is, by the way, a uh, an unpaid position so but i am saying it because i don't think there is another service out there helping type 1 diabetics the way diverge yeah. is helping so it, in that sense it's very unique yep everyone's entitled to truly normal blood sugars and be free from long-term diabetic complications so everyone everyone needs to do what it takes to get normal blood sugars i could not agree more Let's move to Bernstein's uh, protocol because Bernstein isn't keen on um, pumps. And um, so what would you say to people who are hesitant and they're thinking lots of bad things, lots of cannula related problems are going to happen or, uh, you know, pump failures? How common are they for you? They're very uncommon for me, by the way, very. And the scar tissue, which is... 
we commonly hear, I've never had any, I've been using a pump for now, eight, I believe 18, maybe 20 years. I have encountered scar tissue. Bernstein's point is valid. If you are not rotating your sites frequently. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was my problem. I was using my abdomen exclusively and I was not rotating my sites. I was not changing my sites for five, seven days. Oh, I can just put more insulin in there and leave it. I don't have to change my site. And I did absolutely end up with scar tissue in my abdomen. Oh, so wow. I had to stop. I went back to MDI for a year or two. And even to this day, I avoid my abdomen. So that that is a consideration. But what I will tell you is that Dr. Bernstein, as much as he says he doesn't like insulin pumps, he does mention the Omnipod in his book, if you look. <laughs> and in a call recently, he referred to the Omnipod as an insulin delivery device rather than an insulin pump. So I'm kind of taking that and running with it. <laughs> he said he does not like the Omnipod due to its algorithm running you high. I think he's not aware of Loop or AEPS. I don't think he's aware of open source. I think he would have been. I think I think he would be very interested uh, with his engineering background, um, and uh, you know, considering his contribution to um, to making glucose uh, finger prick testing, you know, devices available, readily available for type ones. So with that background, I think he would be very much interested in, in, in looping. I think if he could see our results, I right. think that, that's what he would take. I mean, I think, yeah, I, I think something else he would say is you're not, <laughs> you're not going to get optimal results using a closed loop pump. If you're not following a low carb, high protein diet. If you're just eating the standard American diet, you are going to be all over the place. The way to really dial in um, your numbers and get, get the optimal ANCs is to really follow uh, the Bernstein um, diet plan, um, which makes sense because, you know, carbs are, are uh, the thing that cause the most uh, post-meal uh, glucose roller coasters. So if you dial that back, um, you're going to have a lot more success with, the, with uh, closed loop. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because, uh, you know, we're discussing technology today, obviously, but no technologies guarantees, you know, good A1Cs like Michael's below five, five, five percent. No technology can guarantee you that if you do not make a change in your diet. So the right, the right inputs on the right, right inputs, but it's not even it goes beyond the A1C. It really goes beyond the A1C. So there's a difference between two people uh, having the same A1C, say 5.5 .5 or 5.7, and one person is running steady all day long. Um, that would be me, by the way. My A1C is not as low as the rest of you, but I'm steady. I'm really keeping myself steady all day long. Um, and you know, there, there's a difference between someone like me and someone who's who has the same A1C, but they're up and down and up and down all day long. So it goes beyond the A1C. It's about the standard deviation you mentioned. Standard deviation, that's what I was just about to say. Look at the standard deviation. Can we talk about the standard deviation now? Uh, sure. For, especially for people who haven't heard of it. So what are we looking at here? Well, it's a measure of variability. How mm -hmm. much are we going up and down? And that's a complicated logarithm. I, I don't even know what, what the equation is, but Basically, we're saying, how much are you going up and down? And I want to go up and down as little as possible. Yeah. A non-diabetic is going to be maybe a standard deviation of 10 or less if they're eating a low-carb diet. My goal is less than 20. And right now I'm sitting around 17. So I'm pretty happy with that. I try to maintain less than 4% time in hypoglycemia of less than 70. And I typically maintain that. I've actually been struggling lately because I've lost some weight and my basal needs have dropped. So now I'm having to dial everything back in. But for the most part, I stay under that 4%. How about you, Michael? Yeah, I think um, I think a good standard deviation target uh, would be on 20 or under. Um, and like Allison said, it's it's how, how deep the waves are uh, with your blood sugar. Um, someone who's not a type 1 diabetic, you know, they, they can eat the fruit and the pasta and all that stuff. And they'll, they'll go up, but they'll come back down. 
but a type one diabetic, they'll eat that and they'll stay up and then they'll take too much insulin. They'll go way, way down. Um, so you don't want to be up and then down. You want to be a, as flat as possible. I know there's a lot of people who say, you know, you don't want to be flat. Like the only people who have flat blood sugars are, are deceased people, but you know, that's a bunch of baloney. You want, um, stable blood sugars. You don't want to be up and down. Um, and the only way to, to really dial in your standard deviation is to, um, eat, uh, a predictable, uh, low amount of carbohydrate, eat a high protein, um, diet and take the, the right amount of insulin. So standard deviation is, is extremely important. I'll, I'll just say that. And I've got my time and range changed to 70 to 120 in my sugar mate. So 70 to 120. 3.9 to 6.7 normal. Mm. Right. Yeah. I've changed, I've changed mine to 108, my, my highest. Doesn't mean I never go above it. I do. It's good to have a reminder. But that's, that's like a, a target. That's a goal to be in. I'm not always there. I have to say I do go below 70 occasionally and I'd go uh, above, above six or 108 too. So I've just got my conversions here. So. By the way, you can print this off uh, of my website and I'll put the link below in the description as well. Uh, let's specifically talk about men menopause now, um, Alison. Um, <laughs> I'm interested in it. I'm going through it. So I think the first thing you notice is you're not responding to insulin yeah. the, way you, the way you used to. And as a result, your blood sugars are running higher. And suddenly... Everything that you'd figured out, <laughs> Michael, I can't tell you how disappointing it is, but everything <laughs> that you'd figured out and that was working suddenly goes out of whack. Um, and you just don't know how to fix it. It's not easy to fix. Well, what we typically see is the insulin needs increase and they stay higher. Yes. So what's Part the Part of it's due to less activity. But you're obviously keeping up with the activity. Mm -hmm. we, we tend to see more adipose tissue weight gain in menopause due to the hormone levels. So it, it, it's really unpredictable. Um, I think I said in, in my talk on hormones, my friend Debbie said the only predictable thing about menopause is that it's unpredictable. You just <laughs> kind of have to ride the waves and adjust as you go. Unfortunately, there's just there is nothing out there on type 1 in menopause. I've scoured the internet and there's just nothing. They just, oh, you might have trouble controlling your blood sugars during menopause. That's all they say. So that really needs to be my next deep dive. I think so. I definitely will support you on that because the hardest part of it for me personally was the erratic nature of it because you just don't know. Okay, so if I increase my basal, uh, it might work for two days and the third day, it just, I might be dropping all day long. So how often would you tweak your basal? It's like, it's crazy because no two days are alike. It's that erratic nature of blood sugars and insulin needs. It's, if you're going through a menst menstrual cycle, at least you know day 13 or day 12, you're probably going to increase your um, your uh, Well, basal. the tricky part yeah. comes in to maybe TMI, transparency. I, I've had a hysterectomy four years ago and... I still have my ovaries. So I still have a menstrual cycle, but I don't have a menstrual period. So I have to track my cycles based on other things such as mood swings, bloating, um, water retention, acne breaking out, um, just insulin resistance. That's a big one. So mm -hmm. I, I, I use a, a tracker and I just track the symptoms and I can find a pattern based on those symptoms. But that can be, that can be difficult to nail down. It's um, challenging. Would, it's would your, challenging. Would your loop automatically adjust your basal rates based on? It's helping, but it doesn't nail it completely. I have separate basal profiles for the different portions of the cycle. Yeah, I had. And that. I have overrides for the luteal phase. And yeah. <laughs> wow, I had that too. I had different base basal basals, but since I found out I'm completely erratic, yeah. so I'm no longer. Um, well, whipping, it. I'm sure, would be helpful, but I you're probably so. still going to have to make changes, like every few days. Oh, I'm happy with that. I'm I'm happy with that. I mean, I'm constantly at it. I don't know about the rest of you, but unless 
unless you take your sort of blood sugar seriously and you're at it, you're monitoring constantly, it's it doesn't just happen. Normal blood sugars don't just happen. No. <laughs> the, the flat lines people post are a result of corrections. A little glucose here, a little insulin here. We're watching and we're adjusting. It doesn't, no, it doesn't mean I just nail my dose every time and I'm sitting here with the perfect basil and I run a flat line. No, that doesn't happen. Not yeah, in my I experience. Think, anyway. I think we really need to dispel that myth because lots of people think um, this is what's happening. We're flatlining all day long, every single day. And just maybe relying on the loop and just it's taking care of our basil. It doesn't work like that. I mean, if I move my eyes for two hours and I don't monitor, I have no idea because two hours is a long time. Into, that into two hour the warm up on the G6, I'll go high inevitably. Yeah. If I'm not finger poking, I'm yes. going to go high. Anything could happen in two hours. If I'm too busy and I'm dug into work and then uh, I forget to check. And then I look at it, how did that happen, right? So uh, a lot can happen. So you have to to be at it. Uh, do you agree with that, Michael? Normal blood sugars don't just, just happen. Right, type one diabetes, you let your guard down, it'll kick you in the teeth um, right away. You can go, uh, it's probably easier if you're following a low carb diet, um, not to be a dead horse, but um, even as a low carb uh, person myself, you know, I have good and bad days, but my bad days are, aren't nearly as bad as what it could be. Um, but I've, I've had instances where my pump, uh, like my cannula would kink um, and I'd wake up with like a blood sugar of like 200, 250 or something like that. And I just felt absolutely horrible. And then I did like a sight change. I knew it was because of the pump and not because of something I ate, but um, you know, something like, like what would happen if I didn't wake up. So you, you always have to be on your guard, even if you're wearing a pump. Um, and relying on a CGM uh, that Allison and I were talking about at the beginning of this session, like the G7, sometimes it can be unreliable. Um, if you're getting insulin based on a CGM that's faulty, that's another huge thing that a huge risk that I see. Um, I would really love to see CGMs be a lot more accurate, um, especially if you're going to be relying. There's people out there that do the pumping and they don't even test their their uh, blood sugars. Um, I think I Dexcom, cannot imagine that. <laughs> right, I, I don't understand how they can um, go about that way. Uh, Dexcom used to say that you know it's the no finger stick required CGM, um, and that's just it doesn't add up for me. So you always have to be on your guard. Uh, type one can can kick you in the teeth at any point. So um, it's a 24 by seven by 365 mm -hmm. disease. Yeah. So anything can happen. You never take a break from it, never. The difference, so when I switched to, uh, to Dexcom um, from Libre2, I found out that you can actually calibrate uh, Dexcom, which yeah. is something you couldn't do to the Freestyle Libre. And I don't know if Libre3 allows for, I think Libre3 allows for, no, it's not, it doesn't. So I think that's, you know, that's an advantage because you can check, you can check your blood glucose doing a finger stick test and you put that number in and then it calibrates uh, the app uh, for you. I think that's an advantage. Now I find myself doing it, whereas I didn't do it with the Freestyle because I only checked when I couldn't explain, like it was showing low and then I didn't feel low hyperglycemic, so I would check. Uh, it was very rare, but now because the calibration option is there, I just, <laughs> I'm tempted to just double check and then uh, calibrate it. And oh, I absolutely calibrate. Some people say don't calibrate, but I do. I don't understand those people either. So, um, so is the clue of a closed loop or loop system suitable for a type one child? Oh, we have many children looking. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There are people looping with diluted insulin even. Really? In the, uh, okay. So because which the Omniplot has those wide basal increments of 0 0.05 yes. and children are gonna need very, very small basal increments. So that, that can be a possible solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think looping would be ideal since the, um, or at least using a pump would be ideal because of the, the micro units. Smaller. Exactly, yeah. Um, so how about your endos uh, supporting 
supportive. I mean, you're adults, right? And you haven't needed uh, that much support. And if you did, you had the right pulse to obviously the right channels to help you um, with the looping, with setting up the system. How supportive are, uh, are uh, endos generally with this sort of thing? How knowledgeable they're much are more, they? They're much more supportive of people like you because it's commercially available if you approved. So right. they're, they're going to push you towards the commercially available closed systems. Mm -hmm. They're going to be less likely with the open source, even though there are two consensus statements out there, the New England Journal of Medicine and the Lancet have both published consensus statements about open source closed loop showing better outcomes. So that's there. And I, I try to point the doctors to those statements, but mm -hmm. they're, they're very wary because it's not FDA approved and they could be held liable. So I know there are some doctors who will say, I have patients using this. I'm fine with them using this, but I can't support. You're going to have to find outside support, like, like I have urged. Yeah, as far as my endo, um, she was very supportive of me um, getting my TAN control IQ, but she is not supportive of me having normal blood sugars and A1Cs. Um, my last lab A1C uh, from, from her office was 4.7. Um, and she told me that I must get it up to 6.5 because 6.5 is the measure for good control for type one diabetics. Oh. Um, you see all, all the literature that says, um, you know, th the moment you leave normal, uh, glycemia, uh, that's when your risk for long-term complications goes through the roof. So fortunately I did my homework and I'm in all the, the, uh, grit groups, all the low carb groups. So I know, um, about all, all the risks of running high blood sugars, but a lot of type ones out there, they don't. Um, and they take their, their endos word for gospel. Um, so I think that's something else that, that needs to change. And Dr. Bernstein has um, a theory about that, um, saying that he the endos want to run people high because they're afraid that they're going to be crashing low and be held liable. Um, so the endos would, and like getting a long-term complication from diabetes is just par for the course. So that um, did, yeah. Right. There's less risk for the, the doctor's office to run someone high. So, which is very unfortunate. I recently interviewed uh, Lester Hightower and, you know, uh, Lester on T1D has a Facebook uh, um, page. And he said exactly the same. He said, uh, obviously his son is type one. He said the end of seeing my son for 10 years at most before he moves on to adult uh, um, uh, and also 10 years he'd rather run the child high and he's not seeing he's not actually with the same sort of child and seeing their progress over the years um, so you know as far as he's concerned he'd rather run him high and uh, and that's it and then he's not seeing the complications they don't see the complications yeah they never see and witness the complications this has been wonderful. So if we left any questions out, people, can you put them in the comments below and Allison will come back and uh, Mike will be more than happy to come back um, and uh, answer your questions. So thank you so much, Allison and Michael. We'll thank do this you again and we'll discuss, we'll find something else to talk about next time. Because we'll always have topics to talk Anytime, about. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Right, now we heard from um, Alison Hershey and Michael Fitzpatrick talking about looping. Now here we have the man himself who can help you start the looping journey is John uh, Gelfell. Welcome to Low Carbon Fasting, John. Hello, Nairi, and uh, every, all of your listeners. I'm honored to be here and um, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming, John. I'm very excited to learn more about how to start my looping journey because I'm seriously considering it. So tell me, I am at the moment, John, uh, a user of uh, Omnipod. As you can see, Omnipod pump, and I have Dexcom G6. Where do I go from here? T tell us about T1, T1 Paul, because that's a group or an, um, a, a service that you created. No, Tell there's a correction to that. Um, oh. Can I give you that? Can I give you our yes. our, our origin story? Mm -hmm. Let's start um, with that. 
if you Google anything you Google related to diabetes and what we do, you have to put diabetes after it or it finds all kinds of other stuff. So if you Google Ben West and mm -hmm. diabetes, you'll find out about our founder, Ben West. Ben West is a uh, founder of the We Are Not Waiting movement. And everything has multiple people, but he is a founder, one of less than a handful, perhaps, or a handful. And he is the founder of Night Scout, along a founder of Night Scout, and a founder of uh, Open APS. Mm -hmm. Open APS was the first open source um, automated insulin delivery system, and from it, it was really a development framework. And but it's it's continued to be used to this day as an actual operative AID, automated insulin delivery uh, system. But what it begat as a development platform was both Android APS and iOS Loop, and both of these have different inherent protocol stacks, uh, the inherent way the algorithms work. I should, should have said algorithms. Um, uh, and so Android APS has what's called OREF algorithms and Loop has the Loop algorithms. And they have a little bit different, they're different in the way you interact with them, but they both adjust your basal insulin all day long, every five minutes in, in a syncopation in, in concert with the, the information from the CGM. Hmm. And then they track and compare um, your insulin on board, your carbohydrates on board, your momentum, which is the rise or the lowering, the arrows in the Dexcom, for instance. And uh, um, another thing called retrospective correction, which is basically how much off have I been in the corrections to smooth out the correction. Um, so that's what Loop does. And they do it a little bit differently. I, we do not, we do not, we provide a, a Loop application support subscription so first mm -hmm. off, we, we provide a Night Scout subscription. And another thing for everybody to know is that Ben continues to develop Night Scout and is the principal developer uh, to this day. There's another person as well involved, and I'm drawing a blank right now because I'm excited to be here. But um, Ben has been released all the versions for the last five years and spent all the years before developing and building it. So our customers are funding open source development. And that's, I think, just a really cool thing. A little bit about myself. I've been working with open source professionally for over 40, for, yeah, for over 40 years. Um, I look, I'm 63 years old next in a couple of weeks. So I've been doing that all my life. And that's one reason I'm here too. But the other reason is starting to treat my own diabetes, which is type two diabetes um, with loop. I got my gear into here, so it's hard to show, um, but I'm running loop and I've been running loop for almost three years now. And, uh, I've had some really great effects. So I hope that tells you a little bit. I had to correct who our founder is and where we come from, our bona fides and our our, our, our pedigree. So um, I'm sorry. But Donna, to... quick question. So Night Scout, I don't, I've never used Night Scout. Is it available in all countries? Night Scout is a cloud-based system that, and we provide it as a turnkey system. You, you, you subscribe to our service, you have a Night Scout site immediately that you can start using. And so it's a cloud-based system. Maybe think of it analogous to Gmail. You go to Gmail to do your, your mail and stuff. You create an account and there you are in your inbox. So with T1PAL, you create an account and you get a welcome screen that asks you what kind of devices you're using, whether you're using just mm. the CGM to track your, your glucose readings or whether you're using Android APS or you're using Loop. And there's other permutations in that because Night Scout throughout the history has supported everything to some extent or another. I'm responsible for support and training at T1PAL. And so I have to learn all these systems and how they work as well as my native system. Um, so what Night Scout does is it takes that data that's uploaded by these different systems and then provides a gateway, a central hub that different devices can use to view and analyze that data. For instance, this thing right here is a hobbyist device. It's called an M5 stack and somebody wrote open source software for it. It's hard to focus on it. That makes it a Night Scout client. It shows my, you can't read it, but it shows my insulin on board, my carbohydrates on board. It shows if I'm running an override, if loop is uh, currently um, operating properly and it, it beeps, it turns colors, it does all kinds of things. And here it is. Many of your listeners may have heard of the Sugar Pixel which is a larger little alarm clock looking device that does the same kind of thing. And, and, and it's pretty cool, it has other neat features. So this is a small maybe desktop version or something you can carry with you. Um, so that's a device that uses that Night Scout data. There's also reporting tools uh, built into Night Scout that you can use to generate reports you're very familiar with that you've looked at with your endo before. 
And also there's um, third party tools that can access your Night Scout site and produce even better or different reporting that gives greater depth. So the point is when you get your data to Night Scout, you can analyze your data. And in the looping systems themselves, you can only see a day or actually in the regular portrait mode, you see the last few hours in the prediction. When you turn it sideways, you can see like back to midnight, but that's kind of like driving a car and looking 10 feet in front of the hood. So what you want, what, what Allison works on is part of her uh, program of co-piloting, we call it. She shows you how to review your Night Scout reports to yourself know the impact of your settings, the impact of your behaviors, pre-bolusing, exercising, your luteal phases, and all these different things, and adjust your settings, adjust your usage to get the best outcome. And that's a facet of, re of, of reviewing your Night Scout data. Now, that might sound like a lot of work, but once you start getting in the groove, you know how to look at it, you know how to make an adjustment, and you move on, and Loop is making the decisions every every five minutes, and it's reducing your burden. So everyone who's subscribed, obviously, will be sent that Night Scout device? There's no device. That's just a device you can buy, is what I'm saying. There's the oh. Sugar Pixel as a device. There's all kinds of devices and software apps in the App Store. A person with Android can follow a Looper with, with iPhone Loop. A person with iPhone can follow a person uh -huh. using Android APS. Night Scout is that central wheel and hub. So okay. all what we provide is a Night Scout site. You don't have to build it yourself. You don't have to maintain it. You don't have to uh, maintain the database. Um, and we're very proud of our support. Very fast turnaround, very comprehensive. And we provide real Zoom workshops to get you over the hump or to help you with things and um, in that service. Good so far. I think it's clear so far. So now, so, okay, so let's suppose, let's suppose someone got just got started. Obviously they need to um, create, like set up their settings, right? Their target range, et cetera. So that, well, that's all decided by your pump, the brand of your pump. Well, so we talked about Night Scout. The other thing that we offer direct support for is the Loop app itself. So Night Scout, you can use with any kind of system you're using. Right. And Ben is a founder of that, and we develop and release that. So we run the code that we develop and release to open source for everybody, then we run it. It's kind of a cool thing, and I'm proud of that. Mm. So as far as Loop is concerned, to, to get the Loop app on your phone as a do-it-yourselfer, the community out there has a very good set of instructions that you can follow, but it requires you have the time and the inclination to follow those instructions. And when you have a problem, ask a question to a, a lot of volunteers get a lot of answers, but good answers, and then you move forward. Well, many people don't have the time or inclination for that. Many, <laughs> many people just want, as Apple says, it just works. And so with our service, what we do is we build it, maintain it, update it, and support it comprehensively along with Night Scout. So for our Loop subscribers, we support the entire experience. Mm -hmm. And what that means is you um, also when you're using it with your children, especially our dependents, elders or whoever, there's a remote control capability that we help you with as well and provide the applications for that and the training. So you can um, when your child is sick in bed at night, you don't have to wake them up to give them a little extra bolus or to mm -hmm. run an override, which is something that alters your basic settings. You can just do that from outside and let, let, let them sleep. So, you know, cool things like that's very popular among uh, people who get, who caregivers. By the way, the one app is called Caregivers. So um, that's pretty cool. But, so our subscription, should I talk about prices? Yes, please do. Please do. And I'll put the link below as well for, for our um, audience to just press and, and get access to and see the details. I'll put your website link below as okay, well. Okay, that's great. We're the very, price. Um, very happy and very eager to serve people. So um, our Night Scout service is $11.99 per month. And uh, if you get the coupon when you sign up, it's $9.99 for the first four months. And hey, that's a cup of coffee there. And um, then our Loop subscription service is $37.99 a month. So I guess what I'm supposed to say is less than $50 a month. It's $49.98. Um, and for that amount, the app is always fresh on your phone. If there's updates to the app or whatever, you get them. So every so often there's a must update thing. Mm. And it's not that this harmed anybody, but there's what you call a perfect storm. Think about a box where problems can happen and most are in the middle 
And then you have what you call edge cases, stuff that's just unlikely. And you know, Apple goes to, let's say, Apple goes to great pains to make sure that version 17.0 of the iPhone operating system is okay, but you see it all the time. 70.0.1 comes out a few days later and so forth. And so you don't have to follow the do-it-yourself groups to know that. With us, I, I am responsible for our mobile app release management. I don't code the apps, but I prepare them and make them available to our customers, our clients. And um, it just shows up on your phone. You never have to worry about when it's going to expire. You never have to worry about was there an interim release that you need to have. Um, it's just always there. And that's, I, you know, that's, you may even know how to do these things and follow the instructions well, but you've got what, three kids or maybe two jobs, or you're a single parent, or even your, even everything's good, but you want to spend that time at the soccer game or at the movies or kicking back on the couch. And so it, it, it's really cool that way. Um, and you get the whole thing, Loop and Night Scout. And I think you were asking about how Night Scout, how Loop actually operates, but. So so where so where do you set your, uh, say your target range and basal rate? So that's your pump primarily doing it, right? So you're gonna well, do your, your pump. Your pump is either an older Medtronic pump, but those are about 10 years or so old. And that's almost a specialist niche. Right. Mm -hmm. You would want to find that pump on the aftermarket, secondary market and use it. But there's people who have been using that for a long time mm -hmm. and they don't want to change. Ben, I hope I don't get in trouble. Ben uses the Medtronic pump. Dash is the current. Eros was the version before Dash of Omnipod. And the current version of Omnipod is Omnipod 5, which is a closed proprietary a hybrid closed loop system. And Dash before it and then Omnipod Classic or Eros was before it. And so the Arrow still works with Loop, mm -hmm. but it's not being sold in the U.S. as of the beginning of this year. And it needed an extra piece of equipment, which was an enabler to make it work, but now is kind of a burden because it's an extra piece of equipment to carry and, and work with. So with Dash support, which started about two years ago or so, and now it's the only thing, besides, they, they provide Omnipod 5 and Dash. Mm -hmm. And by the way, people should understand that there's a push to get you on Omnipod 5. So when you say you want Dash and they show up at the pharmacy with a prescription for Omnipod 5, you need to gently say, that's not what I need. I need Omnipod Dash, which is generation four. Mm. So that's a, that's a thing. But when you have those pods, by the way, all three of these pods look identical. The Arrows had a, had a uh, clear tab. The Dash had a blue tab. And now the O5 has a clear tab. But that's the only difference between them uh, sure. and, and visually and size wise and, and how, how they actually operate to do the insulin. It's the controller that's different so, so the omnipod 5 would absolutely work right no the omnipod oh, the dash omnipod does. Five, the, uh, that's my point so if they try to push you to the omnipod 5 you want right. dash mm. now what i've heard is they've limited the availability of the dash starter kit which has the pdm you don't need the pdm when i switch from eros to dash i have a box in there that they sent me at the time but I, there's probably a pdm in it i've never opened it um, you just go straight to the phone. The phone's all you use. And so when you have the app on your phone, that's where we, just like in the PDM, the, the, the personal diabetes manager, where you enter all of your settings in there, yes. your correction factor, your carb ratio, your, mm -hmm. your, your um, basal rate, your scheduled basal rates, you enter all of those into this app. So this is what the app looks like it, on my phone. Mm -hmm. And at the top, we have the device status. We have the CGM. We have the pump. The loop is green and closed, which means loop is doing its thing. We have something that's showing my glucose. We have something that's showing the insulin on board. And that little ups and downs there, and I'm going to turn it sideways. If you look at this sideways, see all those ups and downs? The baseline in between all those up and down squares is the scheduled basal rate. It's zero insulin on board. It means not you're getting zero insulin, but it means your scheduled basal rate, all those upward and downward changes, I wish, oh, it's kind of getting in there, are yes, the is. adjustments to the basal rate that are made every five minutes by um, loop in conjunction with these predictive factors. Um, and those are insulin on board, carbs on board, momentum, or the arrow and retrospective correction. And so loop adjusts your insulin every five minutes and keeps track of the curve of each of those cumulatively so it's very aware of your actual insulin on board. Unlike with PDMs where you would set your duration of insulin action to three hours and then not bolus again for four hours. Yes. Basically, that was to allow the bolus calculator to recommend a bolus, but you not to stack. 
stacking. Mm -hmm. So um, Loop always stacks because every five minutes it's making a change, yes. but it knows how to do that. And so when you do go to get a bolus recommendation, when you do a carb entry, it takes all those factors into account, not just your correction factor, or your, excuse me, your carb ratio. Okay, so my next question is, um, for those of us in the low carbohydrate community, who are not eating that many carbs, but we still need insulin, type ones, I don't know if it's the same for you because you are type 2 on insulin. Let me know if it is the same, but we have to take insulin for protein as well. What do you do with protein? Do you need insulin for protein being a type 2 diabetic or insulin? It's a very good question. And Allison and I have talked about this a lot, and she's really given me a better perspective on it. I um, was insulin deficient. I made insufficient amounts of insulin, just like somebody with type one. And it's telling me I'm in my 72nd hour. So I'm good. Um, I got the beep, 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 beep. Excuse me. So um, what did you ask me again? I got distracted. About the protein. So protein. So I have glucagon function. My beta cells were beaten to submission, you might say, but I don't have autoimmune processes that damaged other parts. And so the beta, the alpha cell function and the glucagon that results help me to have a gluconeogenesis. And, and that creates, that keeps me from lows, but it also has another effect. And Allison would have to tell us again, because I don't remember right now. That whole thing helps me to offset the protein. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that I, I'm, oh, by the way, and we talked about this before the meeting, I have largely and effectively reversed my type two diabetes at 60 years of age. I'm 63 in a couple of weeks. I've been doing this for three years and I have, my C peptide is now in the very low end of sufficient. I'm still highly insulin resistant. I use, um, I've been titrating my, my basal down and down to about the low forties. Three years ago, I used 140 units a day of, of Traceva. So that's pretty cool. I'm, I follow Bernstein's protocols and um, I eat a very low carb, high protein meal. I tend to eat one meal a day. That's not for everybody, um, but that's what I do. So I don't have that protein thing, but how does somebody with type one deal with protein? So when you have the idea of an extended amount of time it takes, and by the way, there's no such thing as an extended bolus in loop because it's always extending your bolus. It's always accounting for things every five <laughs> minutes. But you know how that protein comes on like a whole new meal in two or three hours? Yeah. So in loop, there's a concept of entering future carbs. And you can say loop. So you pre-bolus for the, for the real carbs and you give it a long absorption with the butter, you know, fats in it and stuff. And then when that bolus is delivered right away, you say, now, in two hours, expect the equivalent of a 20-gram hit from the protein. And I'm using easy math, 20-gram hit. Mm -hmm. And now, the algorithm that Loop is using to adjust you, remember, carbs on board is a factor there. Mm -hmm. So when there's more carbs on board registered, because you told it they'd be there, all of a sudden, Loop knows I'm going to have to offset that with insulin. And I'm going to have to watch the rate of up or down to offset it harder or softer or back off or whatever. So... It, it's imperfect, of course, because we don't really know how to map protein, but we figure it out. And so you enter that future carbs, and now loop is informed, and it starts kicking in for those carbs. And when you're aware that it's happening too, you can actually tap and you can say, let's deliver the whole, bol the whole bolus right now instead of having loop gradually deliver it. I hope that answers it. Well, it does. It's very smart. I'm impressed. <laughs> So uh, coming back to the uh, pump options, so people will be wondering now, oh, I'm using this and that pump, so would it work? Uh, does it work? So you mentioned the Medtronic, you mentioned the Omnipod. Any other pumps which work perfectly? T right now, that's it. Android APS has a little bit more support for a few other things. One of the reasons we don't support Android APS is because Apple has X number of phones and it all works the same. Android APS is, is, a, is a chameleon of a thousand faces. And we wouldn't, you know how it is, people out there, you're using Android, you know that this doesn't come on that. You may even know the Dexcom app doesn't come on your phone. And then you have to use something called BYODA, which is a build your own Dexcom app, which allows you to 
create a patch Dexcom app that will run on Android phones that are not Dexcom's not available in the app store for it. So there's a cool thing. Don't think because you have the wrong phone, you can't do that. Also, that that app, since it's been modified and hacked, it's the Dexcom app with patches and changes to it, has some extra cool features that you can turn on as well that make it more versatile. So your people might want to look into BYODA and the features that it has and the fact that it allows you to run uh, the Dexcom app on phones that are where it's not available in the app store. So for us, that fractured market makes it pretty much impossible to scale to that. In a startup business, small business, they have a concept of an MVP, a most viable product. Um, excuse me, a minimum viable product. And so we support Loop. We support it well. We use it. and we can scale to support that among Apple users without having to be people that support every Android phone in the world. However, our users who use Android EPS, get, like I know about BYODA, I know about Extra Plus, I know about uh, different versions of uh, Android and the protocols, like the difference 3.2 uses an NS Client 3. I'm babbling now, but I know all those things. Also, I've run Android APS with oh. um, the same data from my CGM and then a pod that was, that was running uh, sterile sailing and ran that concurrently with the CGM that was driving my actual loop with insulin in it. So I've actually, how are you going to know unless you've done it, right? But I can't have two things delivering insulin at once and my program might use this loop. But that's what we put into being able to help people and guide them to getting things set up. So if you're using Android APS, we can't help you with the app or building the app, but we'll sure help you um, make sure that you're, you're connected right and that your data is being delivered. So uh, if someone signs up today, how long does it take for them to be up and running? Is, is, it, is it a whole long it's, process? It's not very long. And it's all structured to provide you with the best basis for moving forward in the safety. So let me tell you about that. Um, the pathway to loop, as we call it, has some different on-ramps. First off, if you're using MDI right now, you're not on a pump, we require that you get a pump start. Mm -hmm. We don't worry about how long it's been, but we're not medical and we don't start you on a pump, right? And so when you get a pump start, you at least know how to put it on, take it off, work with the mechanics of it. Okay. As soon as you have a pump start, you're ready for the next step. So if you haven't looped before, which is the final step, some people are already loopers or coming back to loop and they have an even faster on-ramp. But the typical on-ramp is you're using a dash pod more often than it's pretty much a dash pod world right now. So you're using a dash pod or you're, you, you're, you're ending your Omnipod 5 and your dash pods are coming in. That's okay. And so then the way we do this is we have what we call a pathway meeting for with you where we do it's a qualification meeting. Or do we have what you want and do you have the right things to get started? Mm -hmm. That's like a half hour meeting. We have that conversation. Now, from there, we go to um, scheduling your sessions. You have two sessions with T1PAL. One of those is transitioning to our providers with Diabridge. The first one is called, and Allison has been working with me side by side and delivering those for the last couple of months um, to get that training. And so that first session we call the Loop Introduction Workshop. And this is where I share my looping phone with you, or she would share hers. And you actually look at my phone and I show you all the functions and what they do. And then I knit together what you're learning so you understand that, well, I look at here and it affects that. And this is how I do this. And so in the doing of that, you learn where the ashtrays and the cup holders are, where the mm -hmm. brake and the gas are, but you learn how they work together. And you get that visual I showed you of the, of the insulin delivery and stuff. And so you know what that means now and, and you're, you're accustomed to it. We follow that one to three days later with your loop day one workshop. One to three days, one day to allow for cognition right? Thinking about what it was, some questions, and no more than three days typically for retention. Oh, we did this a month ago or a week ago. I don't remember. So one to three days, and that's the day one. And that day, um, the looper shares their phone online. So if you're an adult coming into loop, it's relatively simple. If you're a child, by the way, there's different ages and independence levels. And so the looper, the person who has that phone with them all the time, unless they're six or younger or something like this or other, other kinds of, of, of issues with, with independence, you want them there because they at least want to know what's on the phone to some extent. They're not going to get the nitty gritties. Mom or dad's going to do that. Or their, their adult is going to do that. But um, 
it's good to have them there for that. But the second day they have to be there, whatever age they are, because what we're going to do on that day is we're going to take their settings either out of their um, existing PDM for Dash mm. or their PDM for, for Omnipod 5. And we don't make any, we don't tell you anything about settings or anything. And what we do is we move the exact settings over to Luke. And actually, I should say, you do, we show you how to do that, if that makes sense, because mm -hmm. we don't do settings. So we show you how to configure the loop app and get ready to move over. And then we move the CGM session, which is already running over to the new loop app, while, while your delivery is still working uninterrupted. Mm -hmm. And then we get to the moment of change, and then we terminate the, the pod on the old unit, remove it from the body, turn off the PDM, start a new pod on the loop app, and then you're looping. And that's a wonderful time. And I mean, for me, it's, it's like, it's like, wow, we did it. We've got another person on the loop. And so there, for somebody who's not looped before, we have a requirement that they uh, engage a loop um, trained co-pilot. And so mm -hmm. co-pilot, as it, as it implies, is somebody that is your co-pilot. You're always the pilot because it's a do-it-yourself world. I mean, you know, you take the responsibility <laughs> for what you're doing here. Mm -hmm. But Allison, for instance, will then take you and um, have a series of meetings with you where you do a review of your nice guy. She shows you how to use it. And she, at Diverge, offers a follow-up session, I think 48 hours afterwards, and they have a, a real-time chatting thing through the Healthy app. And so you can ask those immediate, oh, but I didn't remember this, or what did I do tonight? And you can ask a few of those questions, of course. And then she meets with you, usually I think 48 or 72 hours, but if you're chatting with her, reveals that you need to meet the next day, she will. And then there's two or three, I think, uh, review sessions where they actually go through your night scout and show you, you see here, we have this adjustment and this reaction. Could that be an ISF issue? And then you go, oh, I see that, you know? And that's what we want to do. We want to not, we want to teach you how to, to see what's going on in there. Of course, Diverge offers ongoing subscription services and you can continue with their care and review all along. Um, but that co-pilot service is a finite one month service with those kinds of, of, of deliverables. So again, you have the, the introduction where I show my loop app working to you, followed by the day one where you come on board and I walk you right through going from what you're on to being a looper. And then the continuous support from Allison, both in your kind of immediately after day one kind of things, through ongoing chatting, but then also focused Zoom sessions to review your settings and suggest, and Allison is a, CDCES and an RN, and she's also a published author of um, gestational pregnancy, girl pregnancies. Yes. And so she's particularly gifted at, in, in working with women's health as it relates. So um, she's good at all of it. So she helps you do all those things. Uh, was that good? Well, John, that was excellent. I, I, I'm thinking now, how about this? So does the algorithm need time? to get used to your, because that's the thing that frustrated me with my current Omnipod 5, because what they call the Omnipod 5, they have a system, well, they have two modes. You can operate it in manual mode or automated mode. And the automated mode, I couldn't give it enough time the, to, for the algorith algorithm because it kept running me so high and I'm not used to it. So I thought, what the heck? I'm not giving it time. I'll just use it on manual mode, which defies its purpose because Right, it's become, to make it becomes easy. the dash. It becomes a dash PDM. It becomes a regular dumb PDM, like with the dash. Right, a regular right. PDM. So well, let's talk about know, the algorithm. How long does it take to actually learn your ways? Let's first talk about Omnipod Five. Um, I think it's a matter of convenience for Dexcom to allow people to say that it learns. It mm. doesn't learn anything. <laughs> I'm not trying to give it a hard time. Well, no, no, I'm not giving it a hard time. Let's talk about what it actually does. It records the total daily insulin from the last three pods. And then it structures itself to deliver a 50-50 basal bolus ratio. Ah. So that doesn't work with low-carb, high-protein diets. I'm running about 90-95% to 5-10%. It's that Omnipod 5 is going to try to force me to run 50-50. So right. when we, there's a... Um, a, 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 a center of mass, a bell curve, or, you know, whatever. Everybody's over there, uh, what I call a, a convenience-oriented therapy as opposed to outcomes-oriented therapy. Mm -hmm. And um, this is where 
you pause for what you have the right to eat. So cake, well, you know, things that we don't necessarily eat, they're balsing for. And so this is the kind of food style, the nutritional profile that the Dexcom G5 is designed to operate with. The other thing is designed to be very opaque on purpose. We don't want to challenge you with a lot of decisions. We just want to let it do what it does. And so that's why there's not a lot of controllability to it. Also, a thing I need to point out is when you look at the Dexcom app, the graph is always looks smooth just about yes. it's smoothed out yeah. you don't really see what's going on in night scout and in the loop app you really see what's going on which is better but again the omnipod 5 is supposed to be just let it do its thing and you're going to be better than you were and if you're eating that way it's yeah. going to be better and so i have a visualization we have a bell curve if we can get that bell curve where people are operating which may be 250 which may be standard deviations above 40 and things like this if and A1Cs of if you're doing well, six, um, you know, according to ADA guidelines or seven, we, we want to take, we as a community of people wanting people to get better, including Dexcom, we want to take and move that bell curve into ADA guidelines. If we can get the bulk of that population between 70 and 180, 70% 70 of the time with an A1C 7% or better, that's going to enrich many lives and lengthen them. Of course, we know that's not the ultimate, but at least if we can get them there. And that's yeah. what Omnipod 5, in my opinion, is great for. But if you're striving for personalized settings, personalized approach, then you need something that's more definable, more controllable. And so here's a good comparison to Android APS. Android APS has a, it, it's like a fighter jet. There's so many knobs and dials and things and stuff. <laughs> it, it's, it's very, um, a fighter jet. I like to compare Loop to a Bentley uh, uh, limousine. <laughs> and so Loop has less, it's more, you know, but they work really well, but you can put your rocks glass on a teak table and drive around town and it doesn't fall off. Whereas in a fighter jet, it's all gonna go all over the place. So in other words, they're adjustable, they're con controllable and configurable, but Loop makes it much easier and still has a lot of control that you can use to specify what you need. And, and so that's what I do with my, my diabetes is different than everybody's diabetes. Everybody's mm -hmm. diabetes varies. And you get to set the settings and work with your behaviors. What do I pre bolus What insulins do I use? How do I integrate the use of regular insulin with the use oh. of the fast acting insulin delivering boluses and basal and, and all that. So Bethany's groups mm -hmm. and let me be 83 and everybody else involved in this community understands the use of R and the Bernstein methods. And so Allison, it's been a real pleasure to work with her on integrating the next level of that level of therapy and awareness into Loop. Because again, we understand our community and I'll say I'm definitely part of our community, even though I have a different type of diabetes, um, has a different set of priorities and stuff and are often ostracized a bit by that other community. And so what they're doing, what they're putting together they think we may be more extreme and they don't account for it and all that. So working with Allison and working with people in this community, it's a found home for me, allows us to experiment and, and look into the, the ways of addressing the use of loop for us. And I don't know what you're, when you talk to Allison, she is doing tremendously. She's Allison is a returning guest on my podcast. And John, you also will be a return, returning guest because we're recording another podcast where you're going to share your story with us. I think we covered this in detail. Uh, just to end, uh, before we uh, wrap this this up, can you share your contact details? So people, where where do people, how do people, people get started? For people in our community, we have two entry points. One is always mail up me at support at t1pal.com. And you get a prompt response, whether it's, you can say, I'm interested in looping. And we'll talk about it, you know, but you can say my Night Scout site isn't doing what I want it to do as well when you're a subscriber. But um, the other way is you can contact Allison directly. I don't, I, I'll, we can give you a link and uh, you probably have a link, but she also has one to sign up for the co-pilot service and she will schedule you for everything. And I wanted to cover that real quick. D depending how ready you are, you can actually be looping in a week. We've done it with people where um, somebody reacted to a, uh, responded to a post Allison made, got a hold of us that day, scheduled her pathway the next day, her, her intro the next day and her day one the next day within 48 plus 12. 
in, in, in less time than a pod, uh, she, was, she was looping. And so we're able to accommodate that for people. And, and that meeting, that original meeting, we qualify you. What are your needs? Let's get, and so Allison prepares a setting sheet for you. That's the other thing. When you work with Allison, you get a setting sheet that includes beyond the settings that we move from your PDM, but loop specific settings. Mm. And so you really get fully locked in. Allison likes to do a um, sensitivity test and a basal test often for people, depending on where you are with that. And that further, because anytime you change the system, if you change from Medtronic to Tandem or Omnipod to Tandem or any of these, or even from Dash to Eros, the settings can be a little bit different. And so you're going to have a period of adjustment. And that's what the co-piloting service locks you in. So I just wanted to let you know that you can go very quick or as slow as you need to. Perfect. All the details will blow people. So please uh, follow Diverge or uh, contact Allison and of course t uh, support at t1pal.com. Thank you so much, John, for this insight. It was brilliant. I love your um, podcast. I've been watching them and thank you for the opportunity to uh, offer our services and, and represent T1PAL. My pleasure. Thank you.